welcome everyone to um, this session of uh, Poets Talk Politics with uh, our guest. I'm going to mispronounce his name, but uh, he told me how to do it properly. So Joseph Eurus Algazin. That was perfect. Uh, perfect. Oh, all right. Such okay. a good job. <laughs> Um, so welcome, Joey. We're, we're going to be uh, talking about uh, his new book, uh, "Feeling A Feeling uh, Called Heaven, uh, which was uh, published this summer, I think came out this summer uh, from uh, Nightboat. And I'm just going to introduce um, everyone on the panel first, and then we're, Joey's going to read uh, a bit from, from the new book. So we have we have a couple of uh, people that have been here before. So we have uh, 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 Malgorzata uh, Mik from uh, Poland. She is a an associate professor at the Department of North American Literature and Culture at uh, Lodz University. And you know one one where uh, she has um, also I'm I'm just going to mention a couple of her interests. She is interested in, in avant-garde and experimental writing in North America, language and post-language writing, new narrative, uh, intergenre writing, uh, and intersections between literature and philosophy. Um, she published um, a couple of years ago um, a, a very interesting book on Leslie Scalapino. And last year, uh, no, no, not last year, this year, she put together a very interesting a conference called uh, American literature um, in extremis, American writing in extremis, I believe. Uh, so, and, and she's now putting together a special issue uh, with uh, texts from that um, event. Then we have, uh, a, you know, a person that's been here most, for most of the sessions that I've, that I've done this, uh, Elena uh, mm -hmm. Siltanen, she is, um, a literature researcher and currently teaches at the Department of English at uh, Lund University in Sweden. Um, and uh, her research focuses on contemporary American poetry, uh, more specifically on how emotional relations are constructed in the reading event and how poetry can situate readers in complex positions. She's published um, most recently a, a series of articles on conceptualism and post-conceptualism and confessionalism, all of these isms. Um, and then she has a very interesting book on John Ashbery, Helena Ginian, Ron Silva, and Ron Silva, uh, which came out in 2016. Uh, and finally, we have uh, our guest of honor. Joey uh, is the author of Utopia and the multi-volume The Lazarus Project, uh, the, the, sorry, The Lazarus Project among others, with uh, Holly Melgard, who will be here, by the way, uh, next, next month. Uh, he has co-authored the trilogy of books, uh, Holly Melgard's Friends and Family, White Trash, and Liquidation. He is a founding member of the publishing collective Troll Thread, and he currently lives in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, so welcome, Joey, and uh, feel free to you know, start your, your reading. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Joelle. Um, thank you so much for having me here. I'm going to read from the book, The Feeling Called Heaven, that Joelle mentioned came out at the end of the summer, beginning of the fall on Night Boat this year. And it's it's a uh, has a long poem and then a coda at the end. And I think I'm just going to read from kind of the beginning of the poem through and then maybe save some time for the guided meditation at the end. I feel like that's always nice. Right. Yeah. Um, OK. Well, I'll just get started with a feeling called heaven. Um, okay, and so the first long poem is called For the Second to Last Time. I wanted to show you something that would give you pleasure before the end of the world. I thought I'd play you a video of antelope or deer moving as a herd across an expanse of green grass, shot from the door of a helicopter, flying in unison with the animals below. As the repurposed foundation for the death of this planet in X number of years. For there's nothing to be done now, but love and embrace the silence of our impending destruction as a species. Offered the gift of consciousness through accident or divine fiat, but has done little with it, slightly lessened the suffering of a few, i.e. the bar was so low and desire so brutal. There's nothing to be done now, but to await 
our own destruction in the presence of each other. This patience then is really all that's necessary. I'm not saying how the world could be better. It can't be better. A better world isn't possible, but patience is possible. Meditation on a few moments of intense deprivation, on all that's left, this impoverishment we've been given, ecstatic reduction or a feeling called heaven that speaks to itself of nothing but a final annihilation that arrives quietly, though it remains perhaps forever in the distance. I wanted to show you something that would remind you of a time in your life before we came together as a way of finding some trace of pleasure or happiness in the presence of each other. This is not a rejection of the world, but a radical acceptance of our own impoverishment that allows us to welcome passivity as a way of reducing both the mind and body to the minimal frequency necessary to maintain this place we now occupy together as we wait for the true end of the world, which is already here and yet has only just begun, an end that began without us, but because of us, and now no longer needs us, as it makes its way slowly through each and every one of us and each and every successive generation. I want you to allow this feeling called heaven, which is little more than a recognition of our presence here together, an acknowledgement that we're not outside the world. And yet nothing's demanded of us to create a modicum of calm and stability, sitting here in the company of each other, because the world is dying, at least for us. We've made it an inhospitable place for us. And yet there's pleasure to be found in the beginning of the end of the world. As you sit listening to my voice, speaking to you, I want you to remember that this is only the beginning of the end. And so we're embarking on this journey together, or more accurately, we're engaged in this process of reduction that erases any distinction between you and anyone else so that you become just one body among many, a material object severed from its utility, merely occupying the space for a time. And in this way, we come to regard this wretched thing we call our body, this vessel or vehicle as little more than a seat of pain and frustration, yet one that we hold so dear as it shrinks in terror at night, as the room in which you're lying down or sitting up, listening to the sound of my voice, settles around you with a noise disconnected from any discernible source, which for that brief moment makes you all too aware of your own fragility. Or at other times, as it swells with anxiety, something you feel welling within you, say on the train, when the arm of a stranger sitting next to you relaxes against your side, gently pressing into your ribs. And as you resist the urge to turn your face and look at this person sitting next to you, to acknowledge this physical closeness and inadvertent touch that wants nothing from you, but needs a place to rest. A place at the beginning of the end that we cannot see, but rest assured for this moment together in the calmness of its late arrival. And in this way, you can think of my words, what I have to say to you as constructing something like a side altar, a place for us to watch for those who will eventually come and replace us, only to keep this watch in our place. For we're little more than surrogates who've come to regard this vessel or vehicle, this wretched thing we call our body as something like a coat or sweater placed gently on the chair beside you in a darkened movie theater, holding this place beside you. For a friend who's on their way to meet you, but has been delayed, and whose absence gives you a reason to keep sitting where you are. And as such, we come to occupy this space between what came before and an end that has already arrived. Visualized in this way, we can understand this beginning as it occurs in the distance, far from us, as something like a boundary or more accurately a wall to gently lean against. As we sit together here in each other's company, I ask that you focus not on the individual thoughts as they pass through your mind, but on the structure of your mind as the channel that these thoughts travel through, as the unconscious communicates with the conscious mind, giving meaning to all your interactions with the world, 
your beliefs and habits, your feelings and emotions. Each individual sensation is simply a message or information traveling through the very material by which you've come to understand, say, the trauma you underwent in being expelled from your mother's body, of gradually assuming this separate and isolated character, this faint noise in the background of your mind. And as you close your eyes, listening to the sound of my voice, as my voice and your thoughts become one and move together from the foreground to the background, fading into a dull hum of atmospheric static, not unlike the hum of the air conditioner that keeps the room you're sitting in at a comfortable 70 degrees. Allow your attention to wander away from my voice and listen to these ambient sounds that vie for your attention daily. These parallel tracks coming together in the mind to create the hushed sound of traffic in the street below your window or your upstairs neighbor moving a chair against the hardwood floor of their living room. And as you listen to these sounds, I want you to remember that this hum is only the sound of our collective death, which we patiently embrace, even if unconsciously accepting this knowledge that emerges as the foundation of our lives together. That not only will we perish individually, but our time as a species is drawing to a close. And while this knowledge remains unthinkable, there are moments here together where we can envision the quiet that would exist without us. The clouds break and the sun glints off pools of irradiated water outside a freeway on-ramp or hospital parking lot in which a few discarded syringes and fragments of plastic tubing bob in the light breeze, traveling across a world emptied of our presence. I want you to hold in your mind, this image of a future world continuing without us, arising from a communal hope that once we've disappeared, this world will reach a quiet equilibrium, the weather again becoming pleasant, the wind no longer carrying the scent of rotting garbage or chemicals burning in the chimney of an anonymous factory, the sweet smell bringing solidity as if the seemingly endless supply of gummy plastic burning somewhere beyond the factory's walls had reconstituted in your lungs, such that you now carry it with you in a minor way. And as the plastic adheres to the cells of the walls of your lungs, it keeps you company as you walk the streets, making your way to work or to dinner after. It's not so much hope as intuition, something that you know directly without needing to analyze it. It bridges the gap between the unconscious and conscious parts of your mind a nonverbal certainty that a time will come when the residue of the human will have disappeared almost entirely, such that what is left of the world will come to regard our time here as a temporary illness or weak parasite that wasn't designed to kill as much as seek out its own end in the host's body. I want you to hold this image in your mind, a future that continues without us is already on its way, having begun in the far distance, not as silence, but as a faint, nearly imperceptible noise that emerges first as silence and then drowns out all other noises, a smothering nothingness that expands to take over the horizon beyond which you cannot see as it dips below your visual plane. And as you sit here listening to my voice, as we sit in the company of each other and my voice and your thoughts become one, you begin to regard these words. What I'm saying to you now is amounting to nothing more than clearing a place for us to rest as we wait together for the end of the world. For there's nothing to be done now besides wait, building these little monuments to ourselves along the way, say a side altar to a forgotten saint that no longer serves as a site of worship. It gives you a moment to rest and kneel along its wood railing, light a candle or two, out of something like duty or habit, just something to do with your hands briefly before continuing on our way. But we know that there's nowhere left for us to go, that we've already arrived where we were headed, this peripheral and inconsequential space we found together. And what we're building is simply this place of rest as we wait for the true end of ourselves. And so instead of grief 
what we find is pleasure. Instead of sadness, there's this feeling called heaven that touches, however faintly, on happiness. One could say we're so happy because our time here together is short and we've prepared our own annihilation. Now, all that's necessary is patience. All that's required of us is to patiently wait for an end we may never witness, except as the ripples of its effects, briefly visible at the edges of our time together, as though this feeling called heaven were something like the waves of the ocean, gently lapping against the wet sand, as the tide slowly rises to meet, say, a blanket spread out in the weak morning light on which you're now calmly sitting as you watch the day pass before you, your eyes unfocused among the gray waves. They crash near what seems like the edge of the ocean and envisioning this kind of tranquility projected out to a great distance that only annihilation could promise, a pleasure almost too pure to experience, the final enunciation of the human in the world spoken in a single voice in the moments leading up to the moment before the last, in which some distant generation lays down together one last time. And then I'll read the meditation at the end, which is called a closing meditation, I guess. I could have come up with a better title, but I didn't. So that's what it's called. Um, okay. And well, here goes. And I'd, I'd like you to close your eyes or lower your eyelids, focusing on the middle distance of the floor in front of you. I want you to get comfortable in your seat, or if you're standing, stand with your legs slightly wider than shoulder width apart, your feet firmly planted on the ground. And whether you're standing or sitting, you begin to feel a string that starts at your seat or the soles of your feet and runs from your tailbone up your spine and out your head to the ceiling above. And as we begin, I want you to remember that all you're doing is preparation for the journey of the head and that you're safe here. No one can hurt you. All you're doing is preparing for the journey ahead and you're safe in the company of my voice. I want you to remember that violence is just information or decorative, like a video of lions and hyenas fighting over the carcass of a wildebeest or antelope or some other dead animal captured with night vision cameras projected on the wall and playing silently in the background. Or if this proves too distracting and takes away from your ability to focus on something other than the video, then visualize a still image projected on a sheet that hangs in front of the wall, moving slightly in the air conditioner's breeze, a screen capped Google image of the sun reflecting off standing water. I want you to hold this image of the sun in your mind. And as you do, notice how it doesn't glitch, but moves in unison with the sheet. And in doing so, becomes not unlike nature. Both act as immersive backdrops or non-mediums, like the human voice or my voice speaking out loud to you now describing or rather staging a series of side altars. This bound method of procedure, my speaking to you now, produces an image like the reflection of the sun, or more accurately, a space for your thoughts to inhabit as something to focus on, but only in the beginning, as my voice will prove more and more unnecessary as it begins to disintegrate into discrete regions of your mind which you can visit for a time or not and leave as you will. And as I'm speaking to you, you'll begin to feel grounded, like you're resting comfortably on an empty platform, one that's been specifically prepared for you, but prepared poorly, or the platform itself is barely visible. The first plateau in an unexplored region of a video game. And as you reach the clearing, it begins to rain slightly. A fine mist covers the air. And now as the water becomes general and covers this wretched thing we call our body, this vessel or vehicle, the pain it experiences, even its pleasures, your twitchings and convulsions, the spasms that involuntarily begin in the head, clouding your thoughts and bringing them too much into focus 
as the pain radiates out to your limbs, as you sit on this bare expanse and the water begins to cover you, the pain and frustration, the sadness you first felt, alone on this plateau, stretching out to the horizon, these feelings start to wash away. And as they leave you, your mind becoming empty and relaxed, you can start to feel each individual drop of water slowly trickle down your skin, joining the other drops in their fall together to the plateau below and feel the rivulets descending down your left and right sides as they pool around you, creating a greater intensity of wetness against your buttocks and thighs as each drop joins its mate and forms this community, this pool of cool and pleasant water that washes away the pain and fear you live with each day. You begin to sense the presence of those who've gone on before you, as if in moving on and shedding their vessels, they left behind a message written in water that caresses your skin and soaks your clothing. So you can no longer tell the difference between the rough cloth and the flesh it covers. In this water, you sense the presence of the anxieties they purge from themselves in moving on, giving up their bodies for a wholeness, not unlike the wholeness you feel at times when your body disappears in a moment of great joy or despair. And you're growing more and more aware of them as you listen to my voice and the wind begins to pick up and the rain falls harder as water lashes against this wretched thing we call our body until you feel the skin on your right forearm begin to open to form a canyon that faces the sky and the falling rain. But instead of feeling pain, you feel a sense of deep calm. The muscles in your right arm, your blood and tendons open up to the bone and greet the water as it falls against your body, collecting in the space it made for itself. And as it does, your blood flows from the open cut, spreading across the water. Watch it turn a faint purple color, growing paler and paler until any distinction between the blood from your vessel and the rain disappears. As your blood ranges across this growing pool of water, you sense it mingling with the presence of those gone on before you. Alone on this plateau, you sense their presence and are assured with the fullness of their company. As the water rises up your thighs, covering you to your belly button, and as the water continues to rise, it covers the plateau an infinity pool stretching out to the light gray sky turning blue. And without a decrease in the rain that no longer falls, but seems to swell of its own accord, moving and caressing your body as the water reaches your chest and neck, it's as though the clothes you once wore have been stripped away and are no longer necessary. And as the water covers you, instead of feeling buoyant, you feel grounded. Instead of rising to the surface, you stay firmly seated on the plateau, an anchor in your mind or something that hovers just below the surface of your thoughts, rooting you to this world and the vehicle of your own body. As the water rises over your head, reaching up to the same colored sky, both a light blue and turning slightly, as if in a clean glass bowl on an empty wooden table, mirroring the movement of the larger room around it. Feel your body now, sitting beneath the surface of this cool, clear liquid, and open your mouth to speak or breathe, to call out to those who've gone on before you. Remember that this is the time you've prepared for and that you're ready. Remember your plans. You try to take a breath, you can't, until you stop trying and step out of this earthly vessel like stepping through a door into another room. Only then can you rise up to the surface to find that your body has gone and your soul become infinitely small, floating like a microbead of plastic, riding the undulating surface of the water under a cloudless and crystal clear blue sky. And lost in the clarity of this color, you begin to return to the room and as you do, I want you to hold in your mind this image of microbeads floating together, a buoyant plastic fog spread across the water. 
an image of something you sensed all along, that you were perfect in this journey you've prepared. Stepping away from the plateau into the surrounding waters requires no faith nor leader, no mother nor father, no system beyond the lives we are already living. This material action, our bright faces and warm smiles as we greet each other in the morning or say goodbye before bed, the very fact of our existence extends out towards our own extinction as a pod of dolphins arching their backs and moving their flukes vertically up and down to generate momentum in the neon blue water, propelling themselves forward and out of the waves and back again, framed by purple flames and the chants of those who came before, singing with one voice in the background. Okay, so that's that. <laughs> yeah, thanks, that's very sweet. Thank, thanks so much, Joey. Yeah, no problem. Thanks so much for that. So, Goshka, do you wanna do you wanna go first? Um, I can. Next? Thank you. Um, thank you for your reading, Joey. Um, I found the book very intriguing and sobering. Um, the first thing I thought about as I was reading it, and then as I was listening to your voice, uh, was this. <laughs> famous um performance by alvin lucier i'm sitting mm. and i wanted to ask um about abstraction about your um references to abstraction and i have something in mind when i'm asking this but i first want to hear what you have to say um, that's, a, that's a setup no um <laughs> when, no no can you um can i ask a question when you say abstraction, um, it's interesting. Well, the Elvin Lucier, there is um, uh, an American poet and writer, Barrett White, who wrote a review of the book and mentioned Elvin Lucier's work in, in terms of it. And it's something that I know of, but I don't know very well, um, which made me sort of go back to it. And it was, it's one of those things where you write something and then you find there's a whole world of literature and thinking that opens up when you write it. So like after I wrote it, I was like, oh, of course I started reading Cage again mm -hmm. and started reading Paulino Oliveros and like other um, modes of sort of deep listening or music and thinking around music that plays on attention very deeply. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, in terms of the Elvin Lucier, Lucier piece, it's something, like I said, I knew of, but I didn't know that well. And so it was interesting when Barrett wrote that to go back to it and to, kind of think about the way that the voice sits in the room or doesn't sit in the room, right? And keep sort of repeating. I remember um, when I first got to Buffalo, uh, Holly, my, who's my wife now, but wasn't at the time, uh, introduced me to Steve Reich's early tape pieces, which are those like, um, they're a much faster, more frenetic uh, pace to it, but it goes really quickly. And you hear that like uh, open the, what is it? open the bruise and let the blood out. I can't remember what is it like, come out to show them, come out to show them, come out to show them. And then eventually the tapes kind of blend, right? And it's this idea of, um, I think what Cage said was that there was a sort of spatial music, uh, the sculpture, the sculptedness of music, right? And so that the time and the space happen sort of simultaneously and that you can't have one without the other. In terms of abstraction, um, I thought it was actually rather concrete. Um, no. <laughs> um, can you, like, when you say abstraction, I mean, I'm totally interested. What do you mean by abstraction? I want to know. I actually didn't finish asking the question, but but I'm going to, to, to do it right now. Okay, good. Thinking about Lucier, who is, you know, um, performing these lines, I'm sitting in a room, and his voice disappears, and it's sort of... Um, disappears into the frequencies of the ambience of the room. Um, and when I'm reading your text, it feels to me um, a little bit like you are doing a similar thing, but in terms of the outside. It's like mm. you are really investigating uh, things um, in this way where they sort of dissipate into noise. Voice changes mm. in 
going to noise, right? Things that are concrete are going to lose their contours. You know, this, this meditation on drowning to me is also a little bit about that. So when I say abstraction, I'm talking about the movement in the um, poem toward losing concrete. I mean, it thinks, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, stop holding their contours, the shapes, everything sort of dissolves, right? Oh, that's very beautiful. I, li I like that. That's a beautiful reading of it. I like that very much. And I think there's um, a moment in, we were talking about before we went live that I know Joao and Alina from a class on Michel Serre, and there's this, a moment in Serre that I always like, that I've never gotten over where he says, I can't convince you of this, but there's something that exists outside language, <laughs> right? I can't convince you this through language but there's something that exists beyond language. And in these moments of allowing the voice to uh, fade into the background or the foreground, you access these, this sort of outside, right? And it's funny that we would think that it would be more abstract somehow, but in fact, it's actually much more concrete, right? It's just in a sense, not linguistic, <laughs> you know? And so there's that, there's that push and, and pull and I think um, I mean, your, I, your reading of it, I think is probably much better than I can explain it. Um, but there's something, I like that, 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 that blurring between the two as, as it moves and it'll recede and come back. Cause I think that's also honest of how we experience any kind of reading. You know, when you, when your mo when your attention fades and it returns as you pass through pages that you didn't know you were reading and then return to it. Right. It's, reading of an actual body in an in a room and that goes back to the lucier right is making the reader aware or not the making the foreground the listener actually being a listener actually being a person and an individual there was a, another piece that was really important in my thinking about this by uh, Vito Acconci where he's sitting on a I forget what it's called I'm horrible with these things that's why I was never a very good academic um and he's sitting and he is playing, he's playing the doors and he's inviting you into the room and he's looking directly in the camera. He's like, why don't you just come over? There's plenty of space. You could just like lie right here and just come over to be fine. And it was that direct address that really made you feel like you, right? Not some, not someone else, but made you feel like you. And I was, I think the second person helps with that. Because most of the time, I remember when I was writing this, I read Eduardo Leve's Suicide, which is a, you know, second person, but that second person isn't you. That second person is the person who kills themselves in the first paragraph. Spoilers, if anyone just bought it, I'm sorry. The rest of the book is very, you know, you find out on the first page, don't get mad at me. Um, but that second person isn't you, it's somebody else. And normally it's either the poet or it's a third person and you're stuck in this voyeuristic role. And instead I wanted something that actually, you know, you were you and you could be addressed. And so if you're being addressed, sometimes you're paying attention, sometimes you're not, it fades back and forth and that mixes between the two. And so, um, and I like the idea of that making it more abstract in a kind of beautiful way. I, I like that very much. I'm going to definitely steal that and butcher it, so I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, because really essentially what you just said is that um, uh, the, the boundary between the concrete and the abstract blurs, but also they get inverted in an interesting way. Totally. You know, what's abstract, um, it, it just means that it's out there. It's somewhere maybe precisely outside of what we can grasp at a particular moment, at a particular frequency, right? Yeah. But I also wanted to uh, move on um, with abstraction, just really prolong this question, which Good. is also very long, because um, I'm also thinking about Berardi here, Franco Bifo mm. Berardi, you know, um, both his uprising and his book about breathing and his reflection. Okay, okay. He, uh, he reflects on poetry uh, and capitalism. And he has this idea that poetry can revitalize solidarity, that poetry can be, essentially, you know, he's a little bit too much because he's saying, essentially, poetry is going to save the world. Well, right. it's going to save the world. And this is what your book shows very, very- Oh, he's doing right now, yeah. Yeah, saving. Uh, <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, also talking about abstraction. And he's saying, you know, abstract poetry, for instance, 
anticipates the abstraction of the capitalism. Mm -hmm. so I think, and Berardi also has in his work, the idea of the cancellation of the future, which is also like super important. And what I love about Berardi is he notes that in, about the cancellation of the future, but he doesn't tell us what the next thing would be, right? And so for me, this idea that um, the extinction of the human species or thinking of the humans as a biological species, what it means is that meaning is no longer guaranteed for us. That meaning can go, meaning will also go extinct, right? With us, so goes meaning. And that if we actually took that seriously and, and had to meditate on that and spend some time with it, what would that mean for temporality, for how we imagine the present or the future, how we thought about the past? And I think Berardi for me was really important. I accessed I, Mark Fisher was the sort of in, as I think for a lot of people, uh, at least um, in the last couple of years, for me, for Berardi to sort of look at that. But his ideas also of uh, connection, again, going back to this idea of, of connection, the sort of analog connection through the voice, through the spoken word. And so I think that his pointing this sort of, that the fantasy of progression going forward and forward is has radically shifted. Like, so I, I teach 18 year, I'm an adjunct and I teach 18 year olds. And when you ask them about the future, the main thing that they actually think about is 2050, because that's the future we hear about now, which is in 2050, if we don't reduce carbon by this much, this is gonna happen. In 2050, if we don't do this, this is gonna happen. 2050 sounds horrible and terrifying. And it's the word that like keeps repeating. And so their future is pinpointed to this like weird, bizarre moment that like keeps happening in the Guardian or the New York Times or like, you know, the, uh, the CCP or whatever it is where they tell you about when the climate's fully gonna have collapsed, <laughs> right? And it becomes this really bizarre sense of futurity. And actually, just yesterday, me and my students were kind of trying to tease out what that even meant, right? In terms of like, can we still think of a future? Does that exist? Because we're going to read a bunch of like Octavia Butler and Ursula Le Guin and this kind of like sci-fi that thinks through a future. And of course they're 18, so I don't go like, there's no future, you we're all going to perish. I'm like, is it still possible we can do it? You know, um, they, don't, they don't pay me to just completely- They haven't read your book, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? You know, and it's also I teach it like eight in the morning. No one needs that at eight in the morning. They need a little something sweet. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. I'll have to look at the the. Is it a book on breathing or is it just a section? Is a book on breathing? That's amazing. I'll have to look at that. Thank you, Elena. Do you want to go? Yeah, I have a, a sort of a longish comment first before I get to my question, but there is a question <laughs> up here somewhere. Just wait for it. Um, so I first of all, I want to start by saying that this is a beautifully written book about our time together on Earth as we face extinction. And uh, I think some of the ideas presented here really seem so obvious and clear, like the idea that there's pleasure to be found in the beginning of the end of the world, that it somehow seems obvious that someone needed to write a book like this. And uh, early on in the book, we find these lines that say, we're engaged in a process of reduction that erases any distinction between you and anyone else, so that you become just one body among many. And what I find particularly interesting here is this idea of um, humans and the individuals that we like to think we are becoming one with others as they disappear into oblivion and how this is presented as somehow comforting in a way as if um, blurring the boundaries between us is like a final image that can give us solace as we wait for the end of the world and perhaps mourn it while we're also asked to recognize the magnitude of the role we played in our own extinction. So I don't know whether that's a reading that you recognize, first of all, but if it is, um, to, one ex to what extent do you think that um, solace or comfort or consolation is needed now? Um, because it seems to me that usually many people would argue that we should not be comforted. Um, for example, I've recently been reading a a book called Effective Echo Criticism, which is a, a collection of academic articles edited by Kyle Blado and Jennifer Ladino from a couple of years ago. And uh, many of the writers there suggest that 
bad feelings should be harnessed for the purposes of environmental discussion. But I think this book, your book in a way seems to turn that notion on its head in an interesting way. So do you want to comment on that? No, no, of course. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a couple of ways that I think we could approach that. One is like, it's funny because I've had other people like point out um, or criticize it in terms of this, like, it's not saying we should fight against it or something. And it's like, also, I don't, it's weird that like the idea of loving each other would be like something that people would think would be like bad politics, I think is interesting. And like being kind to each other. We still, I think a lot of times we have this idea that we need to be shaken awake um, and that we need to harness these bad feelings as though we, and I think that that idea is rooted in a concept of politics that comes from a time when the norm was stable and when the, the median was a stable idea, where instead now we're constantly dis disrupted. We're constantly shooken up. I'm surprised I haven't gotten a text message on my computer as I'm talking to you. My ideas of, of trying to find a kind of baseline normal is constantly being shook by the platforms that we're uh, completely addicted to and currently engaged in having a conversation with. And so I think that one of the things that we could do is start to look at each other and talk about comfort and talk about care and talk about solace. And it's not, um, also this book doesn't pretend to do public policy, right? And that's not my job. My job, I, and my job is to teach 18 year olds how to write theoretically, right? And I have like four jobs because I live in the US and academia here is shit. Like, so <laughs> this isn't a job. This is just trying to communicate some things that I felt, you know, very strongly um, about that I needed to tell, I don't know, the few people who would read the book. And so I think that, yeah, the idea of care, the idea of, um, of sitting together and of allowing grief to be grief. And if we can't grieve what we've done, right, then the fantasy of change will never happen. That we have to start from the position we're in. And that even something like in the US, like the Green New Deal, is predicated on the idea that what we have right now is untenable. That the world we're living in, not the, the next world, but the world that, that I woke up in today is oriented towards extinction. It's oriented towards the end of human life. Every time that I wake up, that's what it's oriented towards. We have a fantasy about the next world, the world to come in 2050 when we change. And also the fantasies we have are all built on production anyways. We're gonna have what we're gonna like have electric cars, right? Well, where do, what do those look like? Well, what does the actual, like, have you, have you looked into what a farm, an electric, like a, a lithium field looks like? They're insane. Like that's what we're gonna do to the world to save it. Like our ideas are completely insane. The things that we need to do, we know what we need to do. We need to turn off the lights. We need to stop consuming fossil fuels. And like, I wish that we could do it. It doesn't seem like we're going to. And like, I don't know why it would be, why it would be bad to just tell people that you love them while, <laughs> while, that's, while that's happening seems weird to me, you know? But like, also that's probably glib and I could see why people would be mad about it. Like, of course, like march in the streets and do those things, I guess. But like, this is a book about creating connection and communication with people because we can't not talk to each other. So what are the stories that we tell each other? And who are we talking to? you know? And so I wanted to have something that says, yeah, that it's not what you will do in the future. There's a line in the book where I say, it's not despite this, that you're worthy of love, but because of it. That if we accept who we are and what we are, that that has to be, that's a place that we're not at yet, at least in my seeing of the world, that we're not at that place yet. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm probably wrong. We should probably like vote better <laughs> I don't yes. that was, you know what i mean yes well i think that's a that's a great answer and i do absolutely agree that's uh, creating care and connection and uh, the things that you talk about are absolutely needed but and i mean it's it's not necessarily the case that um thinking of something like that really completely like shuts out trying to wake people up to think about these things because i think it can mm -hmm. succeed in doing both as well yeah yeah and i think um 
yeah, I think that the way the, the way that we talk to each other and how we tell these stories is important because I think that that's in the end, narratives like this is all we really, this is what we do. This is the only thing that we really do that's better than that. I mean, you know, we're not stronger. We're not faster than other animals. We can't see at night. Our hearing is shit. We can barely smell, but we do this really well. And so seeing what narratives we can construct, I think is, is important because of that. Yeah. I, uh, let me, let me go now. Um, All right, Joel, you go. Hello. Um, I mean, it's just to, to comment, to, to make a, like, a uh, preliminary comment on, on, like, you, you know, Elena asked you a very uh, serious question and, and you were being kind of flippant about it. And, and this is, this, you know, this is the Joey that I've, that I've known, right, for a, for a, for a while, right? And uh, also the, the, you know, the, the poet that I find in, in a bunch of things that I've encountered before, right? Like uh -huh. things that you've written, right? So I was always like going through the book, I was always like looking for, you no. Know, so where's, where's the joke? You know, where's the humor? Uh -huh. You know, what's, what's, uh, is this supposed to be funny or, or are we really supposed to take it seriously, right? And especially because you frame it, as you said, in, in this last part of the, the poem was, you know, a meditation, right? So immediately I'm, I'm sort of, you know, prompted to say, oh, he's, he's you know, he's, he's pulling our leg, right? Uh, right. But, but yeah. no, right? That's, that's precisely, what I think what's, what's so interesting about this project is how, uh, you know, candid and, and, you know, honest and, um, you know, straightforward it is. And, and that's, uh, I think uh, we, we sort of said the same thing, you know, the same people were here. We, we were saying the same thing about uh, Marie Buck's um, a, a book mm -hmm. as well, like how, you know, direct uh, it, it was and how, you know, different that is from, you know, the kind of poetry that we're, we're sort of used to, right? We're sort of used to like, uh, and especially I, I was going to ask you, and I am going to ask you uh, maybe later on the question about like how this relates to, you know, sort of your your own background, right? Because you you sort of uh, were educated in an I mean, like 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 we were, right? In an in institution that was was sort of still tied to you know language poetry and the eighties and the nineties and whatnot. Yeah, right? yeah. And so it, it's interesting to see you know a, a project like this that has right barely nothing to do with the kind of poetry that those people were interested in. And and, um, and and it has right like in, in, and Lina I think brought this up before kinda in in a you know tangential way at least right like that that sort of poetry we we were sort of used to see you know seeing it as utopian as you know as as militant in a way right at least militant uh, against a particular kind of, uh, of thinking about language right and, you know, trying to do politics through language and whatnot. And right, this is right. clearly not, not, I think, not what you're trying to do here, right? It is quite, uh, you know, quite the opposite. It's a very dystopian poem, right? Okay. And so, I, so, so my first question, I guess, would be, do you nonetheless see yourself as, you know, building on that tradition, right? And, you know, uh, those, those people that were in, in, in any case, your, your, your professors and whatnot, right? <laughs> And uh, and how you how how do you see this project in relation to what they were trying to do and you know the kind of politics that they were oriented towards uh, and you know the hey, kind of know. politics that we find here. Yeah, no, that's a really that's a very complicated. You guys are really smart. Um, these are all really complicated questions. I feel bad, Alina. I wasn't being I was being flip, but also I was being I wanted I took that very seriously, and I don't want you to think. Um, but I can't, I'm, you know, I was, I was raised when we learned sarcasm, but how do I say this? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So one of the things is the book marks a pretty big departure from the work that I had made previously, right? Especially with the troll thread stuff. And I, I mean, it has a sort of like autobiographical answer to it was that I had just finished my dissertation at Buffalo and Shiv Katecha, who did his master's at Buffalo and then had moved to New York, had invited me to read at a small reading series. And the thing, the only thing that I had made before that was um, a, the last thing I had made, because you know, the dissertation eats up your life completely, right? 
And the thing that I had made before that was this poem called JJ's Kids, which was I had found a transcript of kids in Jonestown debating capitalism versus socialism. And I put it out right when the election was happening, because that was kind of my, that was how I felt that was going. And, um, and she invited me to read it. And I was like, man, I can't imitate 11 year olds. I, I just can't bring myself to do that. And so I had made this guided meditation for the reading um, in like a couple of days, just right before the reading. So I was like, nothing that I had made previously felt like it applied anymore. And I think that there's a, a couple of reasons for that. And I think one of them is technological that how we engage with text is very different than how we used to engage with text that the movement of the internet from being a space that you actually had to go to into a sort of appification changed the, the reading apparatus that we had and the sort of earlier conceptual work that I had done didn't really speak to that moment anymore. I had also felt there were things that I wanted to sort of to, to actually talk about and to actually think through. And I think that um, there were certain, yeah, I guess even an emphasis on content in a way over, and I don't wanna say over form, cause I think that this is also very formally charged but going further than just, just poetry, because the idea of um, say language writing and sort of post-language writing into conceptualism, I was looking at other things that were influencing me a little bit more, which was like ambient music was a big one. And I also got into the work of Jerzy Grotowski, the Polish playwright and his idea of stripping um, an art form away from any of its, um, uh, how do you say stripping down to what's purely for he for him it was theater and he asks so what is theater and he had this sort of via negativa right where it was we'll take anything away that isn't theater and it'll just be the encounter between the actor and the audience member and so i got interested in saying so what would be just that for poetry you have a text and you have a reader and it's just a confrontation it's a language directed outwards at the person reading it and situating the person reading it there Right. And you can accomplish really interesting, really strange things by doing that. And time opens up in different ways. Right. Like a lot of language writing, um, not all, all of it, but it, it exists almost like kind of a temporarily because they're more interested in sort of the force of language. Right. And sort of also just the insistence around discourse and believing in the strength of discourse as the only thing that exists. Right. Mm -hmm. And seeing all these things as just rhetorical discourses, as opposed to like the embodied person in the room, you know, and how that communicates. And I mean, I see this as an extension of certain language writers. I think Leslie Scalapino, if she's a language writer, that this is an extension of her work. At least I hope I would like to call it. I mean, there's probably a lot of hubris in saying that because she's like a genius and I'm, you know, whatever. And so I like to think that it's close to that or like people who are also associated like with Mamey Bersenbrugge, but also like you know, Creeley stuff in the late 60s, early 70s, you see there's a sort of also phenomenological tradition of like Kiger and Creeley and Grenier that also Scalapino is kind of a part of. And I think that there's a lot of traditions that the sort of canon of American experimental writing can kind of blunt. Because when you go into it, you think, oh, there's, um, you know, you have new American writing and that goes into there's like a West Coast San Francisco Renaissance, a Black Mountain, a New York school, et cetera. Well, that falls apart pretty quickly, right? And then like who language writing gets to be also falls apart when you start thinking about just the kind of myriad of people who were making it. So I think, A, I was starting to get influenced by other people and other places. And I think that I was starting to get, like if one thing that Buffalo taught me that it was really a beautiful thing was that avant-garde writing in the U.S. was actually international and much more international than a lot of people think. There was a huge, obviously through McCaffrey, a huge Canadian influence, but also a very big European influence, right? And looking at concrete from South America, Europe, also like sound poetry, all these different things rolling in. So really troubling that sort of, um, I don't know, stable definition of what that canon could be. And I think that this work, I hope, sits alongside some of it. Um, and also just wanting to, you know, play around with different things and also like to change is a good thing. You know, I think that we live in a world of, of such heavy branding that people can be afraid to change and to know that you need something different. I needed something different, right? 
I needed something different to make sense of where I was in the world. And this is in a sense that this is that book for me was needing to figure some things out. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Uh, thanks, man. Uh, another, let me, let me ask another, another uh, thing that's related to what, what so to, to go, to go back to what uh, Elena was, was saying about like how uh, you, you sort of latch on to, you know, more positive emotions and whatnot, but, but, but at the, you know, at the cost, well, not at the cost, but, but the whole prompt of the book is that there's no, no way back, right? There's no, no way back and no way forward, right? Like the, the whole idea that, that we already mentioned of the, you know, the disappearance of the future, right? Here, it, it really, really, what's, what's so interesting about the book is that you sort of take that seriously. Right, so there is really no redeeming horizon, right? That or, or nothing really positive that we can sort of uh, uh, look forward to, right? And and you you go with that as sort of the concept of, of that you're or the thought experiment that you're trying to, because um, I mean who, who knows, right? That might not be the case, but in any case, for the purposes of this book, right? That's what you're yeah. trying to to do, right? And. And that's why I think these, I mean, out of that impotence, right? Because that's ultimately what the, the feeling that maybe predominates throughout the book is precisely that we, there's nothing we can do, right? Yeah. Uh, El Elena was saying that maybe, you know, and here, you know, we can certainly debate this, right? But, you know, Elena was saying that, you know, maybe we can do both, right? We can feel this sense of despair and impotence and, try to do something to change things. But here, I think, I think what you wanted to, to go with was, was no, no, N nothing matters, right? Nothing we can do will matter, right? Yeah. So, and that ultimately is what amplifies this, what, you know, what, what uh, that hyperbole, hyperbole, let's say, right? That, you know, there's no way around it is ultimately what amplifies these feelings of, you know, uh, you were saying the kindness or, or solidarity empathy and whatnot right and that's i think what what um um you know what what what's so distinct about about the book and about the project um uh, yeah that's not really a question my, my man but uh you know it's uh that's that's beautiful you guys are i don't even know why i'm here i should have just <laughs> well, you guys are, <laughs> let us let us be here yeah seriously you keep, keep going i just want to watch um but a couple of things. One, I had the pleasure with a friend to translate the first book of Ecclesiastes during COVID just for just for fun. And that's where Ecclesiastes begins, is that everything is utterly meaningless. And that um, there's a quote that, that I put in the beginning of the book is that a generation comes and a generation goes, but the earth remains forever. But there's actually in the Hebrew, it's, it's interesting because the Hebrew also has a valence of um, standing opposite or being opposed. And that there's a sort of, um, how do I say this? That within the futility, there's also in that concept of progression, there's something kind of unnatural in it, right? And that in thinking through a sort of meaninglessness of the human endeavor or the possibility of meaninglessness because it's meaningful only for us, Right? that it's not meaningful for someone else or something else or some greater intelligence, right? That like the theism that's rooted in the concept of a future, that if you actually take a non-theistic view of the world, you have to understand that that idea of a future is completely human constructed. And so if we take it seriously, if we take the meaninglessness seriously, if we take also where we are seriously, not a fantasy about a future, but, a, but where we are in this moment in time, and we take that seriously, then we have to reckon with what it actually is, right? And we can still say this, we could do this in the future. These are the possibilities. We can still have hope in a particular way, right? But we could also just as easily meditate on the present moment. And I, I took a meditation class, like I'm sure many people did during COVID because everyone felt like shit, nobody felt good, right? And this was a way to try to feel slightly less like shit and it didn't really work, but I'm doing my best. I'm not very good at meditating. And, but when I was doing it, the reason that I loved it was because 
all of the pressures of the world in that moment weren't there. I knew I only, it was that 30 minutes that I was gonna sit and focus on my breath and fail at it and return to it and fail at it and return to it. That those things of course would be waiting for me when I was done, but those moments were in a sense bookended or that the present, the future and the past could disappear in an awareness of the present moment. And I don't think that the book is necessarily dystopian, it's topian. That would be my argument. It's not utopian or dystopian, it's topian. Like this is just where, it's, where we're at. Like that's it, you know? Like this plastic, I mean, and also I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not a scientist, man. I don't know that much about like, client, can we fix it? Maybe, who knows? I don't know, don't ask me. Right? Like I teach, I study poetry. Like, why would you come to me and ask me? Like, I'm just talking about like affect and how shit feels really. But like, there's plastic in all of our salt. <laughs> you think this is gonna fucking end well? Like, geez, it rains plastic in the mountains, man. Like, you know, like we all know that there's, like when I say a microbead of plastic floating in the wave, you all know where I'm talking about you know which ocean it is. You're not like, oh, he made that up. It's like, oh, he remembered the Pacific. Like, that's what it, where it's at. Like, and so it's just, yeah, it's, it's, I would say outside of that rant, I would say it's topian in a sense. So um, yeah, or at least struggles to be so. Yeah. Yes, just just one last thing, and then we'll move to to Goshka again. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. But just just another thing about about this, what you were just saying about you know the it being utopian, this this idea of you know uh, there's really maybe it, it, things are so bad, right? There's there's very little that we can do about it. But and I, you know as I was saying, um, then what the book does is to put you know an emphasis on solidarity and whatnot right and, and all these positive feelings but what I, I i'm gonna see if i can try to pull elena back in and, and and ask you if you think that there is maybe something other than that right like something other than you know just you know getting close to each other and what whatnot right like some uh, some other you know um some something else that we could maybe uh like do right not, not do i'm sorry but uh take from the book to make our lives better right or 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 for us to 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 conceive of there being a, a future or whatnot or there being something positive after all right even though the book is or or attempts to be really really um realistic right and, and, and as you were saying right like you know uh, topical as you were saying right yeah. but is there something positive other than just uh, you know this this idea of of uh, impotence and and uh, I would say yeah help me out man I'm I'm, uh, I'm kind of lost here but, but yeah I, I think would, you, you I got my say, point <laughs> I get your point I get your point and I think if we take the emphasis away from impotence and put the emphasis on intimacy. Mm -hmm. I think that that is what we can talk about. We can talk about intimacy. We can talk, I mean, the idea that this book would give an answer to what to do about climate change. It's more, this book has climate change as, as a way to, to, to meditate on intimacy in, in a very real way. And to think about what it means to share space with each other and to share this space with each other. Um, our desires, to have a future and to not have this world, to have more than this, than a book, you know what I mean? And to not have the experience of reading it, but what do I do with the experience of reading it? Like, as opposed to just having the experience of reading it. I think to tell a, a personal story, like so when five years ago, I quit drinking entirely. Um, and I, one of the things, and this for the second to last time is, is something I, I stole from Deleuze. And Deleuze talks about drinking and he, and he says, uh, it's in his ABCs, which was that interview that he did right before he died. And as he talks about it, he says, the alcoholic is always preparing the second to last drink. Never the last drink, they're always preparing the second to last drink. And part of addiction is this fantasy of the future that next week, once I get through these things, 
and the drinking will help me get through these things. Then I'll clean up. Once we do these things, then we'll clean up. Then we'll clean up. And the future is actually what allows the present to remain addicted and moving through in a, in a, in a space that the addict themselves doesn't want, right? And it's only when the addict is, is able to start looking at their sort of present condition and say, I don't want any more of this, that they're able to start actually addressing the present moment. And so one sense is an addiction, to, <laughs> that's almost like an addiction to the future um, that, that people have, but it's, and I understand the frustration that you have in saying, so what, so like, yeah, no, things are horrible. What do we do? Where do we go? And it's like, but it's also thinking like that, that won't let us call things what they are. Like we have climate, in the US, we have climate refugees on our Southern border. We don't call them that at all because it's the people who are coming from Nicaragua and Honduras and Guatemala, those are refugees, A, from failed governments because of US foreign policy, but also because of failed crops. Because like these places are going to be unlivable and we won't call these things what they are. And so it was a desire to, to begin with that moment and to say, well, if we accept that, if we accept that that's where we are and we accept that that's what we've done, how can we still have intimacy with each other? How can we look at each other? And I think that one thing that I believe very, or have come to believe after writing the book is that if we start at a place of isolation and alienation from each other, that we move towards a place of acceptance and co-presence and attention. You know, one could call it love, I guess, but holding attention with each other. I'm reminded of this um, beautiful quote by Simone Weil at the end of her essay on school studies, or what is the right use of school towards an appreciation of God, it's the longest title in the world. But she says that when you see your neighbor and you say, how's it going with you? That you're able to understand how it's going with them, not as a member of the afflicted, but in the individual specificity of their answer. And so one of the things, if this book then, if we can take it anywhere, it's an insistence on the local, it's an insistence on the immediate, on looking at each other and saying like, what does it mean to share space with you right now? What does it mean for us to talk, you know? And that space can be the local of a Zoom call, weirdly enough, right? Or the local of Holly, who's probably watching this in the other <laughs> room, right? <laughs> On, you know, Facebook Live. So like what the different locals are and how they're embedded in each other and what intimacy is, it was the kind of the beginning of me thinking through this. And obviously I think, a lot of you know the humor that I use when I'm responding to these questions is really a candid way of, or a non-candid way of me saying, honestly, I don't know. I don't know. And I think that, you know, right now is a pretty scary place. It's a pretty scary time. And I'm just trying to think through that and think, well, what are the things that we can say to each other? And they're not all pleasant. I think I, you know, I say some out-of-pocket shit in this. I say like, you know, that humans, the only thing we have to offer the world is our collective death is like the body oozes on like a, on a, I don't know, on like a shore while the waves are coming. There's a lot of ocean in this. I live in New York now, it's an island. Like, you know, there's a lot of ocean. Um, but yeah, that went off the rails at the end, but you get what I mean. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Joa. Guys, do, do you wanna ask uh, Joey, like a last question? Um, maybe it's not a question because you guys have said so much uh, of what I also wanted to ask about. So I loved uh, your remarks um, about Grotowski, Joey. I think it's absolutely crucial in your project. And I can definitely see that you have been sort of thinking about it very intensely. And I was also thinking about enactment and sort of staging, right? That the mm. text stages and enacts rather than narrates, mm -hmm. um, which is very important in this case. And it's always important for me also to encounter this kind of intensity, right? I mean, th this was also the intensity that Scalapino had in her texts. They were enactment, enactments. Um, so I wanted to ask perhaps about your, your take on sort of energy slash you know exhaustion like do you think this kind of text helps to recuperate energy you know i'm thinking about psychopolitics here and mm -hmm. like all sorts of pressures you know because then also i'm thinking about meditation and how 
fucking difficult it is, you know? It doesn't bring you comfort most of the time. Right. And it's not, it's not its job. If, you are, if, if you're really serious about meditation, it can be um, an ordeal, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, I'm wondering how you are thinking about these things. I mean, I think that that's really interesting. I think that to, to I hadn't thought about it in terms of energy, but I, I to think about the way that an expenditure, ex, expending energy actually gives you energy, right. right? Like anyone who's taught knows that. Like when you have a, when you have a class that's a real class, not like most classes aren't real classes, but when you have those few that are real classes and you kind of leave it all out and you know everyone else works hard, sometimes you leave feeling like really light, right? And ready to continue to do more things. Um, and I think that by this expended, expending of energy and this idea of exhaustion, that there can be a mode of recuperation, right? And I think that meditation, I was, um, is a, is a sort of technology, right? That we've developed over thousands of years to access certain um, emotional states or psychological states, right? Um, in the same way that prayer functions, meditation functions, I think also psychoanalysis in certain ways can also function in that way. In the same way that theater and ritual can function. There's this beautiful piece by one of Grotowski's students by Peter Brook, The Empty Square, where he talks about Shakespeare as just having two hours it's just, if you think of Hamlet as two hours, all of a sudden things really change, right? And it's like, we're just gonna get together for these two hours and this is what's gonna happen, right? And what can you do in those two hours? And that becomes something really interesting. And there's someone who, what was it? Uh, Larry Eigner does that in some of his works where he takes like space and he turns it temporal or he takes time and he turns it spatial. And it's that sort of rearranging of energy that is, um, really interesting. So I like that. I hadn't thought about that before, but that's a really interesting idea. I yeah. love your reference to Eigner, and, and I'll just leave it at that. I just absolutely love it. I think it's totally there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Elena, do you want to ask something? As well? Um, yeah, well, this is a fairly specific Point. And it's also perhaps terrible as a question because it's usually a bad idea to ask poets to discuss specific interpretations of their poems, but maybe I'll just pose it as something that everyone can comment on. So I was thinking of this point in a closing meditation where towards the end you write about how the you steps out of the body and to find out your body has gone and your soul become infinitely small, floating like a micro bead of plastic. You mentioned that earlier, I think. And it's really, it's a perfect, beautiful visualization of dying and becoming one with nature, but also as something that doesn't quite blend into to the surrounding world. So the human now becomes a micro bead of plastic. And I can perhaps think of various ways of reading this. Maybe the micro bead of plastic never did belong to nature. So um, that must need, mean something. Or perhaps it means that our existence does now continue forever because that's what happens to plastic. It doesn't disappear. Maybe it haunts nature and exists there like a foreign object that refuses to become soil or a part of the earth or something like that. So yeah, I don't know. Does anyone want to comment on that? Wow. Do I have to? That was beautiful. I feel like I ruined half of these questions by saying anything. That was beautiful. Um, no, I hadn't thought about that. And I love the idea of haunting it because I think throughout the text, it's thinking about the trace, the trace of the human that even if we go extinct or when we go extinct, that that trace will remain. Um, there's, that, uh, there's another idea in the book that I cop just like straight from Sarah, which was the idea of when you cut your hand and you start to, the scars on your body that make a map of your uh, interaction with the world or your confrontation with the world. That the that plastic in your reading of it would in a sense be a sort of scarring that leaves at least that sort of trace of the human, right? That like, obviously the things that are on it and have this sort of impact on it won't just disappear, but there's a sort of like fossil record in a sense. And the plastic functions as a sort of fossil record in a very strange way, as it kind of, you know, disintegrates, but never disappears in that very, um, yeah, 
strain. Yeah, that was, sorry, I just talked around it. I have nothing to say to that, but yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, that's good enough, I think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult to probably comment on that, but yeah. yeah. I, I just wanted to, to close maybe, um, you know, going by going back to actually uh, one of the lines that I quoted on the, the, the Facebook post that I made about the, the event. Uh, a line that I really liked was, the, you know, when you say perhaps the real problem is that extinction is taking too long, right? And uh, this is, this is uh, something that I uh, was trying to, to say when I asked my, my previous question was what, what I think this, this book does really well, right? Is that it really telescopes the temporality to, to this real sense of imminence, right? This real sense of danger. That we don't feel most of the times, right? Like yeah. because when you, when you, uh, as you were saying, Joey, right? Like we hear about all of these things that are, are going to happen in uh, in 2050 or something, right? Or or further in in the future, right? And so we 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 kind of just just oh yeah, I mean that's that's coming later, right? But not right now, maybe things are still you know we can still fix things and whatnot. Yeah. So yeah. what what this book does really well, and I think does well also. And this is what I was trying to say before, right? That is useful for, or constructive as well, right? Constructive for, you know, uh, thinking about these things maybe more seriously, right? And more urgently, right? Is that it does give you this sense of, uh, uh, you know, there's no way, no way out, right? So you better start thinking about it right now, right? Not, not uh, you know, next generation or, or something like that, right? Or maybe, you know, just doing these, you know, minimal things, right? Recycling and whatnot, it's not gonna, it's not gonna work, right? You better right. start thinking. I think the, the book does that really well. You better start thinking more seriously, right? Yeah. About these issues, right? So yeah, I, I think that is what well, I mean, as I was, uh, that's what I was trying to get to before, right? Is that that's, I think to me, the positive uh, work that the, that the, the book does more than just, you know, uh, you know, telling us to, you know, to, to care about each other and whatnot, is that it, it, it injects the sense of... Uh, you really don't, want, to, really don't want to be told to care for people, Shabbat. No, no, I just don't like people at all. Shabbat <laughs> <laughs> well, was like, give me more than that. No, yeah. What am I, a child? Play nice? <laughs> That's what your book says? Play nice? <laughs> no, no, no. no. And, and if it does, you know, and, and again, like, if, if it does say that, right, like, as you said, right, like, that's that's sort of um, you know the first comment I made was that that's that's really not what one would expect from you know I, I don't want to say someone like you right but from a you know an experimental poet right yeah yeah something so uh, you know direct and so um, yeah you know emotional well, I, think, I think that there's a real risk in that and a risk in being direct in a way that is vulnerable and open because we live in a world now that's predicated on fake directness where we express ourselves along platforms that monetize that expression and that i don't think that there's a, a mistake that the algorithm feeds on personal expression and now we express ourselves so much like i don't think that that's an accident um but i think that the wager or risk in this or the experiment in this was what would it be like to talk directly, but to risk that openness or that vulnerability and to say things that are really important to me that I needed to say and to risk saying something I needed to say, but not telling someone else how they needed to respond. And I think, and not framing that response for them, which is why I'm so taken by all of these beautiful responses. All right. So uh, thank you, thank you, Joey. Thank, thank you, you so all. much for coming, and, and I hope people, uh, you know, read the book. Uh, it's it's on uh, unlike Holly's, yeah. Unlike Holly's is not available on on Kindle, right? So this this we could get it right away uh, in Europe, yeah. right? So it it's easier for yeah. us to get through. Okay, good, because I don't think paper exists anymore. I think that <laughs> no, seriously, like books, you can't get half of the books in the bookstore right now so 
we're going to be fine. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Joey. And thanks all of you for, for coming. Yeah, thank you all so much. Yeah.